All right, well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to another uh, video devotional that I'm going to do a quick um, run through Jude 3 and 4. You know, Jude is one chapter, and so today we're going to jump into 3 and 4. Last week we talked about uh, Jude's identity as the brother of Jesus, and I gave sort of a hypothetical situation. Um, you know, again, to note, when I say things uh, and talk about things like that that are skeptical, I'm not saying that that's for sure the case. Like, I don't know, it's possible that the Catholic view is right. Uh, but when I look at Jewish culture and context, uh, it seems likely to me that if Joseph died young, which we think he did because he's never mentioned again, uh, that, that the Jewish custom probably would have held of one of Joseph's brothers coming and stepping in and maybe uh, marrying Mary. And then maybe they had kids together, or maybe Joseph and Mary had a bunch of kids in the time when he was alive, and all those brothers and sisters are Joseph and Mary's kids. You know, it's hard to know exactly, but whatever the case, Mary has children, uh, and, you know, whatever view you think is the right one, those kids got to come from somewhere, <laughs> and Jude and James are two of them, and they are inspired writers of the New Testament, so people we need to get to know better. Uh, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw up uh, our page that we have here uh, with the text on it, so you can see it. And uh, this is Jude 3 and 4. This is Blue Letter Bible, which is one of many programs that you can use out there, but I like this one for a couple reasons that I'll show you in just a second. Uh, but here's, here's what it says. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Uh, a couple things I want to just talk about. Uh, I'm going to go into more detail about verse 4 next week. But verse 3, I want to highlight a couple things here. The first is uh, this word, beloved. That expression is used all throughout the New Testament, of course. But just a reminder, a reminder of uh, the inspired, Holy Spirit-inspired texts of the New Testament, the authors are always calling you and me and the people of that day who were part of this faith, the ones that have been kept for Jesus Christ, is how he described it last week, the ones who have been called uh, beloved. Uh, and there's a combination in that, in that expression, the beloved of the person who's writing, yes. So when I think of you, um, you're beloved to me, my my fellow members of this church, right? The people that I've been guarded to, or that I've been charged and called to pastor in all of the things that means. Uh, but also beloved of God. You're beloved because look at what he's done for you. That you are a part of this family of God is, is a blessing you should never take for granted. And he says, beloved. So he starts with that. And, and this next part is the one I really want to hone in on. Uh, let me just put a little blue on that there. Um, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation. So think about this. Uh, although implies that there's something coming, right? In just a second. But he's saying, uh, I really, really wanted to write to you about our common salvation, about the warm and fuzzy stuff, the beautiful and, you know, heart lifting mind-expanding, love-bringing, joy-inducing truths of the Christian faith. Like, I wanted to write to you about those. As a pastor, I want to talk to you about those things all the time. Everybody does. On some level, every church is probably, uh, you know, erring on the side of talking about our common salvation. There's some churches, that's all they talk about is our common salvation. But, but here's the thing. Like, so Jude says, I want to do that. I want to write you a letter. Uh, that, that would highlight all of those beautiful things that you see throughout the rest of the New Testament. Um, but something else has to happen, right? So I found it necessary to write, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Um, it was necessary. There's a necessity that's come up. Something has come up that's made it necessary uh, to write. And to appeal to you. Now, let me just pull something up here real quick. Uh, this is the Greek text here that we can take a look at. And this is how you understand and look at uh, different words. And so you can kind of see uh, the way it was uh, translated here a little bit. 
But the necessity to write to you appealing. Parakaleo. This is a really powerful word. It's a word that is, uh, well, there's a bunch of different words that actually get translated uh, from parakaleo. But uh, begging, entreating, beseeching, uh, you know, striving to appease by entreaty. So that's the appealing. It's a strong emotional plea. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff here. Let me just listen something out there real quick here. Uh, that this is the word that Jesus uses when he says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Uh, let me just pull that one up really quick here. Take a look. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be parakaleoed. This is the same word that gets used to describe, Jesus uses to describe the Holy Spirit. He is the parakaleo. He is the paraclete, the comforter, is maybe how you've heard it described before. Um, and so there's the appeal, the strong emotional connection. That's what he's doing. I'm pleading with you with this emotional connection that's that's wrapped up in love, that's wrapped up in this desire to comfort and to uh, and to show um, you know gratitude and mercy. And it's this feeling like, please, 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 I'm begging you, I'm begging you. Contend for the faith. This word contend is a word that I I wish that they would translate it what it literally means. Uh, contend is kind of a nice way of saying fight. <laughs> I fight for the faith. Uh, that was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, let me just look at you for a second here. Fight for the faith. He says there's a time for celebration. There's a time for joy. There's a time for warm fuzzies and happy feelings. And as REM once said, shiny, happy people holding hands, right? <laughs> there's a time for the things that make us feel good. But then he says, there's a necessity. There's a necessary time that sometimes comes where we must fight for the faith. We must fight for it. You know, that word contend, the word that uh, that the Greek word in that is actually an athletic term. And so it's the one that you'll see when the Apostle Paul talks about running the race. I've fought the good fight. I've run the race. It's the same type of words that are being used. Contending, wrestling, grappling for on behalf of the faith. Uh, can't we all just get along is not really a Christian New Testament idea. Unity in Christ certainly is. That Christians would be unified around the main things. But what are the main things is the important question. And Jude says that sometimes something comes up that, me that makes it an absolute necessity for us to fight on behalf of the main things. Now, that word, uh, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. This isn't talking about faith as a feeling. This isn't talking about faith as something that we possess. That's a different thing. Uh, altogether, the trust that we've talked about actually last week's sermon in the early service, I talked a little bit about faith being something that needs to be pulled out and exercised, right? And we're not talking about that specifically. This is a different way of talking about faith. This is the faith. This is the body of teaching, the body of doctrinal belief that has been around since the beginning that he says must be fought on behalf of. You must fight for this. Now, it's the, it's the faith that was once for all delivered for the saints. That once for all word is used a couple times in the New Testament to talk about Jesus dying once for all. The idea being that it's not going to happen again. It's a completely unique event. The faith once for all delivered to the saints right around 33 AD was when it completely got solidified. The death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the coming of the Holy Spirit uh, and was being passed on then by the apostles who learned it from Jesus uh, and the Holy Spirit working through Jesus, uh, then were filled with that Holy Spirit and power to speak that same truth and passed it on to others. But it was a faith. It was like a body of teaching that was delivered to them. Uh, there is not just, 
Christianity historically is not just a matter of a bunch of people bringing their opinions about the biblical text and saying, well, I think this and you think that and those two things totally contradict each other about like who Jesus was and why Jesus died. No, there is a truth that must be fought on behalf of. Otherwise, we won't have the faith that was delivered to the saints. That's the paradigm there. We won't have the faith if we don't fight for it. Now, fight doesn't mean, you know, taking up arms and killing, right? That's the mistake that the church has made in the past. But he's talking about uh, fighting and contending in this way, in a spiritual way. You know, he's talking about fighting and contending in an intellectual way, in a, in a relational way. But giving people a reason, giving people the reasons we have to believe why we believe, not letting people in the church get away with a shoddy version of the faith once for all delivered to the saints, to fight for it. Now, why do we need to fight for it? Let me just pull up uh, verse 4 here. It says, for, that's an important word to pay attention to in the Bible, uh, for, let me show you real quick what I'm talking about. There we go. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, just a few quick things here to point out. There's a reason. He's saying uh, something's happening that's made it necessary to fight for the faith, which is exactly what still happens today. Um, a lot of people want to put their heads in the sand about things that are happening in the world that are directly in contradiction to the faith once for all delivered to the saints, directly in contradiction of the lordship of Christ. I'm talking about issues of gender, sexuality, philosophy, intellectualism, uh, the, the economics, uh, ideas about what is the good life and what isn't the good life, uh, ideas about what makes peace in the world and what doesn't make peace in the world, ideas about how to relate to each other, ideas about what we can do and can't do with our bodies. Uh, all of these things are constantly being raised up against the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Uh, that's kind of what it is to live as aliens, is the way the scripture describes us as Christians. Aliens in this world. We belong to another one now. We are children of another son, right? A heavenly son. And we, uh, we are no longer connected in that way to this worldly system that has sort of risen up in opposition for thousands of years now to our Lord. And he says, certain people have crept in unnoticed too long ago were designated for this condemnation. Now, when he says designated for this condemnation, that's, that's sort of a, um, basically a way of saying that, well, we might not have noticed it. Uh, they crept in unnoticed by us. <laughs> And they started spreading some of these ideas that were dangerous ideas. God has known about it. He's not having one pulled over on him, right? He's not having the wool pulled over on his eyes. Uh, he, is, he is fully aware of the situation that's happening. And from a very long time ago, he has said, yeah, the people who creep in and do these kind of things, I don't know how else to put it. Uh, it's a very harsh word, but designated for this condemnation means set aside to be damned, you know, condemned to punishment, judgment. It's kind of a scary thing. He says they're ungodly people, but they've crept in unnoticed, which means they, on the surface, they look like godly people. And they've perverted the grace of our God into sensuality. So real quick, uh, grace is this concept that can be abused very easily. The Apostle Paul talks about this in the book of Romans. But uh, grace is something that we can definitely find ourselves stumbling into uh, and then be so blown away by how beautiful it is, like it's applied to us, whether whatever we did, you know, it's, it's a gift from God to us, from one who um, we can't repay in any way, shape, or form. And so sometimes people's brains explode in, in joy and gratitude, and out of that joy and gratitude, then they begin to abuse grace. And he's saying here is sensuality comes in. And sensuality is not just sexuality, that's part of it. But sensuality is passion and emotion and the things you feel like you want to do. 
And uh, in light of the grace of God, there's a group of people in the church who are saying, you've been forgiven. It's all grace. Now do whatever you want, essentially. And guess what? If you do whatever you want, you'll experience more grace. So it's like, it's actually a win-win for everybody. So sin all you want because grace will just pile on top of you then and you'll have more of it because it's all grace, man. It's all grace. He says, if you do that, as they do that, they are denying their only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Denying him. Um, a person who is obsessed with grace and who thinks that all there is to this Christian life is just receiving more grace on top of grace on top of grace as we continue to live however we like, they've not yet understood that Jesus is also a king. You see, the grace-filled Savior who looks upon us with eyes of love, yes, the beloved, yes. Is he also a master and a lord and a king uh, who wants to put boundaries and parameters into your life as that king that say, don't go any further than this. You can have every tree in this garden, but there's this one tree that if you eat from it, you'll die. That's the one tree we want, right? That perversion of grace says, well, I should be able to have that tree too. <laughs> you know, it's all good. Well, it's not all good. Uh, in Christ, in Christ, you will experience new levels of joy you didn't even know were possible. But those are completely wrapped up in a realistic picture of ourselves that continues to put us in our place and put him in his place. And so um, when we see him say these things, Master and Lord, uh, perverting the grace of God into sensuality, it's a good reminder, friends, that every time we recognize we need to be people who are profoundly aware and understanding of the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints so that we can recognize and be aware of when people creep in unnoticed and begin to pervert it. And Jude says, fight for it. It's worth fighting for. It is everything that he's given us, that Jesus has given us, uh, and it's worth fighting for. So friends, I want to leave at that. We'll talk more about who those people are, as, as Jude kind of talks more about who those people are, uh, we think we have some ideas about maybe who they are. But um, that's, uh, that's all I want to give to you today, to a reminder that if we don't contend, if we don't fight for the faiths once for all delivered to the saints, we don't have a faith once for all delivered to the saints. Uh, and a reminder that no matter what happens, as these things occur, uh, that God knows. God is in control. He sees even if we don't. Uh, but we must be people, in light of the truth that he has given us, who continue to put him in his place and put ourselves in our place to recognize that he is the master, he is the king, he is the Lord, and we are not. And one of the ways that you do that is by receiving the faith once for all delivered and beginning to take it into yourself and living according to it. And the more you live according to it, as it transforms you and changes you and makes you the person you were actually created to be, that masterpiece that the book of Ephesians says you were created to, to be in order to do good works in the world, as that happens in you, more and more and more, uh, you will begin to uh, appreciate and love that truth more and be transformed into the image of Jesus so that when people come in and pervert it, you won't be so easily taken in. And then you'll be able to fight on behalf of this faith you have been given, to not let a single word of New Age doctrine creep in, right? A single word of Eastern philosophy creep in. A single word of secular humanism creep in or of atheistic or agnostic philosophy creep in and begin to pervert the grace of God. Because there's a faith once for all delivered to the saints. We possess it. We need to hang on to it. We need to fight for it because that's what it means to make him master and Lord in our lives. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.